Father, we just come before you tonight. My God, we are truly, truly, truly grateful. Grateful, oh God, for all that you have done, all that you do, and all that you continue to do. Spirit of the living God, we just come before you tonight. My God, we rise from our sleep and our slumber. Good God, and we look to you. Father, we come to you by faith. The songwriter says that we have come this far by faith, lean in on the Lord, trust in, in his holy word. He has never failed me yet. And Father, we look over our lives, we look in our lives, we look through our lives, we look around our lives, we look all around us. And we see, oh God, there are endless, endless, endless times, God, that you have intervened and you have moved heaven and earth so we can understand who you are to us. No wonder the songwriter pens, Lord, I am amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you, how much you love me because of the things that you do. Even, my God, the things that you do, and we at times just take it for granted, not realizing, my God, that when you said you will never leave us nor forsake us, you meant every word of it. There are so much things that you have put in place to grab our attention, to help us to understand that, my God, when you said you'll never leave us nor forsake us and you will provide for us, my God, all we have to do is to take the time just to pause and just look around. Look around, oh God, and we will see, my God, your hand moving stuff around, rearranging, fixing, telling things, my God, that want to make it this place. You stretched forth your hands and you said, not this house, not my daughter, not my son, peace be still. And the things, my God, that has its intention to create such disruption in our lives. God, you call those things and you said no. And for that tonight, we just give you thanks and we give you praise. We come, oh God. And our prayer, our hearts cry, oh God, is that you would help us, my God, to begin to exercise our faith. Because when, oh God, we exercise our faith, not only is it beneficial to us, but from what we have read thus far in Hebrews chapter number 11, we see that it is beneficial to so many different people. My God, if Moses had not exercised faith, what would have become of the children of Israel? If Noah had not exercised faith, what would have become of his family, my God? and the animals that you, my God, call and ordain to be in the ark for him to care for and to keep and to uh, just to protect, what would have become of them? If Abraham did not exercise faith and just believe in spite of the fact that what you declare, his body was failing and everything around him, my God, did not give him a sense of comfort or did not give him, my God, peace within to say, yes, God is going to do this. The question is, God, what do we do? When we look with our eyes and things are not adding up, can we still see, feel and believe what you have declared to us in our heart? No wonder you have said to us and you continue to say to us, oh God, that perception it's not what we see with our eyes, but it's what you have revealed in our heart. And it's the divine revelation that you have given unto us in times of uncertainty that helps to reposition, cause us to pivot and lean in the direction, my God, that you are, my God, telling us that this is going to be the outcome. No wonder the old songwriter said, I've learned how to lean and depend on Jesus. He is my strength. And he's my guide. I learn how to lean and depend on him. If I trust him, he will provide. What a fellowship and what a joy divine. Lean and lean and lean in on the Lord. So God, in order for me to lean in your direction, I have to get, I have to expunge the things that I've been taught culturally, generationally. My God, I have to expunge those things out of my mind. Point of reference, uh, that just, oh God, limits me and my experience, my relationship with you. God, these are the things, yes, God, that I have to expunge out of my mind and out of my heart. In order for me to please you, I have to displease the world. And so the question is, I have a decision that I have to make. When you speak to me in times of uncertainty and you give me your word to help me to understand that this too will pass and it will not be like this all the time. Help me, oh God, in my times of uncertainty and want to please man to, oh God, just learn just to begin to lean in your direction. 
Because again, God, if you give us your word, you tell us before one drop or one tittle of your word fail to come to pass, heaven and earth will vanquish. And so that's how serious you are. And so it is my prayer tonight, O oh God, that as we continue to read and to look and to explore faith and what it is and what you want us to do with faith, we will look at where we are. We will examine our faith. We will ask ourselves the, the hard question. Have I exercised? Have I lived? Have I uh, used my faith? And if not, God, we're on this journey where you're going to take us from, my God, being fearful of exercising our faith to where we become people of faith. Because faith, I heard it says, it is the currency that allows us to do transaction in heaven. So in order for us, my God, to reach out and to touch you, we do it by faith. Your word declared that God is a spirit. And we can't physically touch you, but we come into communication and conversation with you and you speak to us. You declare things to us, my God, and we have to digest, we have to ingest, we have to internalize it, and we have to work through every reservation. Everything that we have been taught becomes secondary and divine revelation becomes primary, and you teach us how to set those things in motion. We come before you tonight. And we're asking you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, help me to examine my actions, my attitude, my heart, and everything, my God, that I've done thus far. The things that you have spoken to me in faith and told me to do, but fear got the best of me, God, and I walked away or I put it on pause. And because I was uncertain, I may have looked at myself and based on what they had to say about me, God, I believe them and I forfeit that which you have asked me to do. But tonight we come and we're praying as we read your word, God, that your word will read us. And where we are weighed in the balance and found wanting, wanting of being more like you, wanting, my God, of taking the initial step to exercise our faith. We are praying tonight, God, that you will fill the gap. My God, anything, my God, that stands between me, you, and me exercising my faith. Tonight, my prayer, oh God, is that you will identify what those things or things are. And God, this will create an opportunity for me to come and to pray about, my God, whatever these things are. We come before you, and we're asking you tonight, Lord God, tabernacle with us, my God. Spend quality time with us and work through the citadel of our heart. Work through the recesses of my mind and my heart. And where you have spoken to me before and where I fail to execute that which you have spoken unto me. Let us go back, Lord. As the good old songwriter say, take me back there, Lord. Take me back. Take me back and let us walk this walk with you. I place my hand in yours and walk me through the moments where I'm fearful, I'm doubtful. And God, reassure me in those moments as my God, the psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness. For his name's sake, and yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God, I'm going to fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me, your rod and your staff, your comfort me. You have prepared a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You have anointed my head, where do I my cup run it over? Surely goodness and mercy shall for me all the days of my life. God, and I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, because you're my shepherd. And so I place my hand in yours. I place my entire being in your hand. And I'm asking you, Lord God, to walk me through these fearful, these moments that are intimidated, individuals who are intimidating to me and cause me, my God, to want to take my faith and put it on pause. I pray tonight, God, that you'll give us holy boldness to be able to stand. And having done everything to stand, we stand and we do exactly what you're asking us to do, because God, it is our obedience that will bring forward all deliverance and the persons who are waiting on us, their deliverance is wrapped up and tied up in me being obedient to you. My disobedient incarcerate me and it extend the prison, my God, terms of the individuals who are incarcerated and in the prison of sin. So my prayer tonight is God, you will help me to stand in faith and having done everything to stand just to stand. And you will do the rest. Father, we come and we're asking God that you will just tabernacle with us, saturate the service, 
with your presence. And we pray, eternal God, that you will have your way. Have your way, O oh God. Have your way tonight. Father, we look to you and we say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. 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 So question for you again. What are the biggest challenge you find thus far when you think about your faith, exercising your faith, set in faith in motion? Let me say this before you answer that. So again, faith, it's the essence. The essence of faith consists of believing and receiving what God has revealed. So the essence of faith. It has to do with, it consists rather in believing and receiving what God has revealed. So if God speak a word to you and say, this is what I want you to do, or this is what your tomorrow look like. Number one, do you receive it? And number two, do you, number one, do you believe it? And number two, do you receive it? And number three, do you then set it in motion? Got to do the work. Hmm? Got to do the work. Because right. faith without works, the scriptures say, is dead. And I think the challenge for us as God people, again, is God is forever speaking. He is forever informing. He is forever instructing. He is forever giving us divine revelation how to mitigate certain circumstances and how to get out of certain circumstances. But for us, we have a tendency, we have a propensity of looking at the reputation of the thing that seems overwhelming, challenging, difficult, and hard. And we look at the history of that particular thing or that particular person, and we look at the history and how the, the history of that thing have created and disrupted so many lives. But we fail as God's people to look at the reputation of the God that we serve. Can I say that again? Sure. We look at the history. We look at the, the resume, if you will, of a particular thing, a, 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 a challenge, and how it disrupted and how it created chaos and confusion in the lives of others, not realizing that if God tells you to face it and to deal with it and to get through it, he already know that you are going to be victorious, but you have to first face your fear in what the thing is. And then you have to believe the divine revelation that he gives unto us, right? And then three, we have to receive it. So it's one thing for God to speak to me in my doubts and in my fear. But it's another thing, number one, for me to believe what he's saying, because if I don't believe it, I'm not going to interact with what he's saying. Right. So the question is, oftentimes you will read the scripture and you will see where individuals say, Lord, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Because again, like we read this morning, when we prayed this morning about the story with David and Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter number 17. Goliath was a pain in the sight of Israel, in the sight of um, the children of Israel. He was a thorn. He was, you name it. He struck fear in the hearts of these men. But you think about David, right? A 17-year-old boy who went to bring food to his brothers. And when he went to bring food to his brothers, excuse me, he saw Goliath standing in the valley, hurling insult at the God that he served and saying all type of negative things. And these men, think about this if you will, they're trained soldiers, they're warriors, but because of the size and stature and the reputation of Goliath, they became fearful. And you think about this young boy who look at the same sets of circumstance, but his response was different. And you want to know why? 
he did not look at the reputation or remotely conceive the reputation of Goliath. He is looking at the God that he served. He's looking at the God that he served. And he he's stood up. Than, and he's much bigger than Goliath. There you go. The God that we serve, he is much bigger than him. So now if we look at David's response in this moment, David stood up in faith and he declared, this uncircumcised Philistine is going to die. And can you imagine these trained soldiers again surrounding this young boy and he is speaking the things that will become a reality? Can you imagine, if you will, immerse yourself in that space, if you will. You're amongst the trained soldiers. Again, Goliath's reputation is of such that he creates chaos and any army that he fights, he destroys them. So Goliath has a winning record. And we have this thing inside of us where we begin to look at the records of individuals and what they've accomplished. And we get so uh, entrenched in all of that, that we lose sight of God. They're looking at Goliath's record. And he has win this battle. And he, they remember what they did to this nation and that nation. And now it is their turn but they don't see that the God that they serve is able to deliver them from the hand of Goliath. And it took this young boy, this young boy to come and to stand in faith amidst what seems like a fearful situation. And he stand in faith and he declare, he asks the question, what shall be given to the man who kills or fix this problem that Israel is having. Two things. Number one, the king is going to give his daughter to the man who kill or fix this problem, hand in marriage. And then number two, the family of the man who gets rid of this problem that Israel is having, they'll never pay taxes again for the rest of their life. David sat and he pondered, okay, I'll take that. I'll take that. And David goes to King Saul. And when he goes to King Saul, he said to him, I am going to fight Goliath and I'm going to kill him. And you know what King Saul does? And you know what the world does to us as well when we stand up in faith? And we declare these things. King Saul looks at him and he says, you are but a little boy. You are but a youth. David said, sir, that may be the case. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. And you see, this is where us as believer, we have to give an account my God, for, you know, whenever they come and they question you want to do stuff, you have to be ready to share what God did in you, through you, and with you that gives you the confidence to stand and to declare that what God did then, he is going to do now. David, and I just pictured this, the Bible doesn't say it, so we're going to read it and see what it says. But creative privilege allowed me the opportunity to say what I think. David, in my mind, I picture him just taking out his resume. Let's talk about resume stuff. And David took out his resume, and David unfolded his resume. When King Saul said, why should I allow you to go and to fight Goliath. David said, sir, I got up one day, and we're going to read it. We're going to read it. David said, sir, I got up one day, and when I did, a bear came and took one of my father's sheep. And I went after the bear. I grabbed him by the beard. I took the sheep out of his mouth, and I slew it. Not bad. And the King Saul said, what else did you do, son? And David said, 
another occasion, a lion came and had the audacity to take one of my father's sheep. And I went after him and I slew him, took the sheep out of his mouth, and I restored him back to the fold. David then go on to say that this uncircumcised Philistine will suffer the same fate. And can you imagine what that did in the mind of King Saul? All the doubt was now erased. Why? Because of the things that you did in God. Why should I let you do this? The opportunity is here, and you are going to let me do it because of this, this, and this that I did under the anointing and the instruction of God. Question so far? No. Okay. So let's look at First Samuel chapter number 17. And we're going to read through it tonight. 1 Samuel chapter number 17, it says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle, and were gathered at Sukkoth, and belo which belong, excuse me, to Judea. 1 Samuel chapter number 17, that's where we are. They encamped between Sukkoth and Asa in Asa and of Dothim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up the battle in array against the Philistines. So when they say they drew up the battle, the battle was now set and everybody is, you know, positioning men looking at their sword and they're just waiting for the command to say charge. Verse mm -hmm. three says the Philistines stood on a mountain on the on one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side between on the other side, which with sorry, a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistine named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet, my God, in his hand, and he had a we and he had and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of his coat was five thousand shekel of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin between his shoulder. Now the staff of the spear was like a weaver's beam. A weaver's beam was that instrument that they used to use to cut and to shred grain. Kind of looked like this. And then there was like a handle that comes up and they would literally swing it this way to cut the uh, grain. So those are the things that Goliath came um, with verse eight, he said, then he stood and he cried out to the army of Israel and said unto them, why have you come out, my God, to line up in battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you, the servant of Saul, choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then my God, we will be your servant. But if I prevail, against him and kill him, then you shall be our serve. You shall be our servant and service. And the Philistine says, I defy the army of Israel this day. Give me a man, my God, that we may fight together. When Saul, watch this, when Saul and all Israel heard the word of the Philistine, they were dismayed and they were greatly afraid. These were trained soldiers. Mm -hmm. They're trained soldiers, and one man, because of his size and his stature and his reputation, stood up and spoke words that drove fear in them. So I want you to understand the atmosphere that they're in. And for us at times, these are some of the reasons why it's difficult for us to exercise faith because of the atmosphere that we're in. But you see, the faith in God, it's not... Uh, conditional to anything or anyone. Our faith in God is of such that we just exercise our faith in him. Watch this. Now, David was the son of the Ephrathite of, 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 of Bethlehem of Judah, whose name was Jesse, and now had eight sons 
And the man was old and advanced in years in his days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of the three sons were Elab, the firstborn, Abimadab, the secondborn, and Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep in Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near, presented himself for 40 days more than he was. So notice, if you will, for 40 days, Goliath stood up and he's saying, give me somebody to fight. And he's saying all the different things that drove fear into them. He's talking about the armies that he defeated and who he killed and what he's going to do to them. I'm going to do this to you like I did to that. And it drove fear again because of the size of Goliath. Verse 17. Then Jesse said to his son, David, take now for your brothers an ephod of the dried grains and these 10 loaves and run to your brother's camp. Then carry these 10 cheese to the captains and their thousands and see how your brothers fear and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they all, and now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elam fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper and took the things, my God, and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight, excuse me, and showed him for the battle. For Israel and the Philistine had drew up the battle in a ring, army against army. David left his supplies in the hands of the supply keeper and ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Watch discouragement. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Then as he talked with uh, then as he talked with them, there was a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistine, my God, and he spake according to the same words. So David heard them. And all the men, my God, when they saw the man, fled from him. And were dreadfully afraid. The size and the stature drove fear. So watch this. Verse 25. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with riches and give his daughter and give his father's host exemption from taxes in Israel. So whoever take care of the problem, you'll get to marry the king's daughter. Your family don't have to pay taxes again forever. So David spake with the man who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered and said in this manner, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, when he heard, he spake to the man. Sorry, Eliab, his older brother, heard when he spoke to the man. And Eliab's anger was arose against David. And he said, why do you come down here? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? So he's being disrespectful. Mm -hmm. You're a shepherd. You don't know nothing about fighting. You need to go back in that sheep, herd them sheep. You need to go back in and take care of the sheep. Mm -hmm. But I want you to understand how we keep talking about this and the Lord keep reminding us about negotiating with ourselves. You see, when the naysayers and the doubts and the disrespect and, and, and discouragement come, you have to negotiate with yourself and you have to look at what God revealed to you. That's important. You have to be able to push that aside and keep going. It's like swimming, Candy. You think about it. When we swim, you know what we do? We take what is before us and we push it behind us. We take what is before us, my God, and we push it behind us. I thank you, Lord. You take what is before you and you push it behind. 
So you have to swim through the discouragement by taking it and putting it behind you. And David is swimming through all of what the negativity that his brother has to say. Uh, da, 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 verse 90 and verse 28. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spake with the men, and Eliab anger was arose against David and said unto him, Why do you come down here? And with whom you have left those few sheep, take it in the wilderness and push it behind you. I know your pride, my God, and your insolence of your heart. For you have come, my God, down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there a cause? Mm -hmm. I'm your brother. I'm just inquiring about the problem because I might just have a solution. Mm -hmm. But again, you see, people are going to look at you based on how they view you. And this is why it's important for you to know who you are in God, because they're going to look at the opportunity. And because of your background, your history, and where you're from, they don't think that opportunity should be afforded you. But when that's the reality that you have to navigate, Kenya, you have to do what? Swim. Just keep pushing it back. Yeah. You have to just take what they say and put it behind you because you see you're swimming, you're making forward progress. Mm -hmm. ah. Then he turned to them towards another and said the same thing. And these people answered him, at the first one did. Now when the words which David spake were heard, they reported them to King Saul, and he sent for him. Remember, we keep talking about this as we are praying about faith. A man's and a woman's gift will make room for them and bring them before great men. It is in the book of Timothy where it says, let no man despise thy youth. So not because you're young and they're looking at your age, they don't understand your experience with God and in God. And it is your experience in God and with God that affords you the opportunity to stand and you're going to shock the world. Hmm. Well, you got to keep swimming. You got to keep swimming. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, reported them to Saul, and he sent to him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Talking about Goliath, your servant will go and fight the Philistine. So Saul said to David, you are not able to stand against the Philistine and to fight with him. Watch this, because you're just but a youth. And he's a man of war from his youth. But again, He's been, doing, he's been fighting. Goliath has been fighting since he was young. Goliath's been fighting since he was a boy. Now he's a man. And they look at David and say, David, you're but a youth. His experience and his reputation and all of that, but tonight, good God. Hmm. You're going to take what's before you, you're going to push it behind you because this is what faith is. Faith is like swimming. Take what's before you. You push it behind. Ooh, I thank you tonight, God. Verse 34. But David said to Saul, <laughs> watch this. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came out and took a lamb out of the flock. I went after it and I struck it and delivered the lamb out, delivered the lamb from the mouth. And when I arose, and when it arose against me, I caught it by the beard and struck it and kill it. Kill it. You grabbed a lion by the beard? What? what, what? <laughs> but you say you. But you. Yeah, I'm reading my resume to you. Because you're telling me about Goliath's resume. But let me tell you about my resume in God. And while you're doing this, good God, I feel you tonight, God. You're swimming. Take what's before you, you just push it behind you. Let me keep swimming here. David says now in 36, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the army 
of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who deliver me, watch this from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Mm -hmm. Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. So regardless of the negativity that came to discourage and to cripple, again, it's what God has revealed to you. You first have to believe it, number one, and you two, you have to receive it. Mm -hmm. So you believe, and then you receive. So you believe, and then you receive. You believe the word that God spoke to you, time of uncertainty, you receive it. And when anything or anyone come to discredit, to discount, to stop, to hinder, to prevent, it's the word of God that he has given unto you, and you just have to swim. Go, oh, good God. Like Nemo, just keep swimming. You just got to take what's before you and push it behind. Behind. Push it behind. Mm. That's what it looks like when we are living in faith. Mm -hmm. And now it goes on now in 34. So Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and he clothed him, my God, with a coat of mail. And David fastened a sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, and you see, this is faith. David went before Saul in his outfit as a shepherd. He has a sling stone and maybe a bottle of water on this side. Saul said, after you tell me what you did, you have... My God, the temperament to go into fight. So let me clothe you for this battle. I'm going to put a helmet. I'm going to put a breastplate. I'm going to clothe you. I'm going to give you a sword and everything. And when Saul put everything on David, watch faith. David said to Saul, I appreciate the gesture, but I've not proven these. In other words, I've not fought any combat in these. And I can go with these. And can you imagine in that moment what that would have done and how that would have caused David to look in the eyes of Saul? What do you mean you're not going in these? What are you going to take? But the story continues. Mm -hmm. Good God, we're swimming to Going upstream, Lord. Yes, we're going upstream. And then he took his staff. No, no, no. He said, David said, da, 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 da. I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David took, then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five stones from the brook, and put them in a shepherd bag, in a porch, which he had and a sling in his hand, and drew near to the Philistine. Watch this. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. So David had Goliath as somebody who bore his shield. Verse 42, it says, And when the Philistine looked, and he saw David, he disdained him. Again, here comes the discouragement. But you're only a youth. The scripture says, let no man despise thy youth. You're only a youth. You're ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David and is gone. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air. And the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, watch this. You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But watch this. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel, who you have defeated. This day, watch faith. This day. The Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you and I will take your head from you. And this day I will give my God the carcasses 
of the camps of the Philistines to the bird of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. And all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel, all because this young boy decide to stand up in faith based on divine revelation. So it was when the Philistine arose, came and drew near to meet David. David hurried and ran towards the army to meet the Philistines. So David ain't playing with this. David is running towards him because of the confidence and the faith that he have. Then David put his hand into the bag. So he's running. Notice, if you will, he's running. And he put his hand into the bag and he took out a stone. And my God, he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. And the stone sank in his forehead. And he fell to the face and he fell on his face to the earth. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, it struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of the sheath, killed him, cut his head off. And the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, and they fled. And now the men of Israel arose and shouted, and pursue the Philistine as far as the entrance of the valley of the gate of Ekron. And wounded, and the wounded of the Philistines fell among the road, even as far as Gath and the Ekron. Then the children of Israel turned from chasing the Philistine, and they plundered their tents, and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it back to Jerusalem, and put but but he put his armor. In the tent, when Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, my God, he was spurred out again. When Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, my God, as your soul live, O king, I do not know. So the king said, inquire whose son this young man is. And David returned from slaughter of the Philistine. And Abner took him and brought him to Saul with the head of the Philistine. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered and said, I am the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. A man's gift would make room for him or her bring you before a great man. Mm -hmm. It's going to be faith for you not to assimilate and to be like everybody else. Because everybody else would have accepted the armor that the king put on. David said, I've not proven these. I'm going in the name of the Lord. And it takes faith for you to reject what the world has to give onto you and to stand under the authority of Jesus Christ and of the Lord. Question before we pray. No. Mm -hmm. he, just, he had a little stone and a slingshot. And faith in God. And faith. And yeah, and faith. Gotta have that. Gotta have faith. Father, we come before you tonight. And oh God, we are truly, truly, truly grateful. Grateful, oh God, for the stories that you afford us the opportunity to read. We're reading the story of David, just a young boy. Discouraged. They despise his youth. They question his courage. And they question, why should we afford you the opportunity to do this? But unbeknownst to them, David was fighting many battles before with the Lord. And when Saul said, why should I allow you? David pulled out his resume and said, sir, let me tell you this. One day I was tending to my father's sheep. A lion came at the audacity to take one. And I went after the lion, grabbed him by the beard, took the sheep out of his mouth and slew it. And I guess word got out there in the jungle, if you will, and a deer heard and decided, let me try him on the side. And the bear came. And I did the same. I had to go up against the bear. And when Saul heard the fighting spirit that was in David, he said, okay, let me dress you for this battle. But it's going to take faith for us to reject 
the things that the world wants to give unto us to fight the battles for the Lord. The scripture is right in that it says the battle is not yours, but it belongs to the Lord. And if it's God's battle, then all he wants me to do is to stand and to represent him. David said, I'm going to go in the name of the Lord. And I'm going to take care of this problem that Israel have had for a while. And David ran into the battle when all the other men that were trained soldiers stood in fear and cowered. David stood in faith, my God, and he decided that with God, I can do all things. David had to swim, and this is what you have been showing us tonight, oh God. For us to stand in faith, we have to swim. When we swim, we take what is before us, and we push it behind us. So all the discouragement that was before, David had to put it behind him. And this is what we have to do in our own life. We have to negotiate with ourselves by taking what is before us, that is discouragement, that is doubt, that is not of you. And we have to just put it behind us and we have to keep making forward progress. Because if we spend time in and with the discouragement, my God, we will find that, my God, it will begin to eat away at the faith and the courage that we have. It will cause us, my God, to question ourselves. So tonight, God, we're learning where there is discouragement, God. We just have to keep moving. We don't entertain it. We, we don't want to be a part of it. My God, because it will be a wet blanket that saps our energy, and it will cause us, my God, to want to give up and to quit and to uh, forfeit the things that you called us to do to be and become. And so we come before you tonight, Lord God. And my prayer, oh God, is that you would help us tonight. Help us. Think about the things that you have called and asked us to do. David was tasked with the responsibility to go and to kill Goliath. Mm. But when you look at him, they said, you are you. You can't do this. You're not able. They, 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 they started looking at him. But you see, my God, David had to encourage himself in the Lord. And that David is saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. With God, all things are possible. And this is how David swam. Took what was before him, the discouragement. God, he just put it behind him and he kept going. He kept going because David knew that until I get the psalm, my God, nothing happened. So all the discouragement that was before him that came from his brothers and all the other men, he had to just move that out the way because my target audience is Saul and my conversation with him because he is the decider. He is the one who is going to make the decision. He needs to know, to see, and to hear what is on my resume. So I am keep swimming. David kept swimming. And when David, I imagine in my mind, got to King Saul, began to tread water. And he began to talk to King Saul. This is what I'm going to do. And when King Saul said, I need to dress you for this, David stood and David said, no. I'm going to fight this battle with the Lord. And I want you to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I want you to stand and, my God, everything that you have been taught to look at an individual, you look at the stature, but the Lord is going to use this example to cause you to look at the heart and the fight that is in me. I'm not one to come and to brag and to present myself a certain. I come in humility. Because it is the God in me who's going to fight this. It is not. And David stood up and he said his peace. And when David left Saul, I believe David looked to the heavens and said, God, this battle is yours. It belongs to you. Hmm. But if you would just use me in this moment. I told you, Lord God, that I will go where you send me and I will do that which you ask me to do. Mm -hmm. This is a problem for Israel and you have given me the confidence and the faith to stand in this moment and to deal with this. God, I need to pause for a moment because while I was swimming and pushing discouragement and everything behind me, 
I can't believe that my own flesh, my own brother would have said that. So God, I need you to help me to forgive him and help me now to focus on that which you have called me to do, which is to take care of this problem. And when David paused and just gather himself in God, and when the Lord spoke to him and said, my son, run towards him and take the stone and do what you do best. David in faith ran towards the problem when everybody else was afraid and they cowered. And so tonight we come before you, Lord God. And regardless of the Goliaths that are in front of us, regardless of the giants that are in front of us, giant despair, giant discouragement, you name it, regardless of the giants, my God, that are before us tonight, it is going to take faith in God for me to stand. And having done everything to stand, God, you just want me to stand. And so tonight, oh God, I pray for every giant, my God, that have tortured and tormented and have haunted us. Every giant tonight. We're slaying them in the spirit tonight. And give your sons and your daughters confidence. My God, to cut the head off the giant. Why? Because the enemy they see today, they won't see them anymore. David declared that this uncircumcised Philistine, that is it for you. You open up your mouth and you disrespected the Lord. And that is it. That is it. So I pray tonight, Father, as we examine our hearts and as we search our hearts and as we look over our life, look in our life, maybe where we are today, maybe there was a giant that we had to encounter today mm -hmm. and the things that the giant had to say cause us to be fearful and cause us to want to give up and cause us to want to quit mm -hmm. but in faith tonight lord god you're causing us to face our giants and you're giving us divine battle strategy in order to fight and to kill and to get rid of these giants mm -hmm. because my god giants they do fall and the giants in our lives, just like Goliath, who stood up and defied Israel for 40 days. Maybe for us, my God, the torture and the torment has been going on for a longer time, 40 years maybe. But tonight, Lord God, this is it. Mm. This is it tonight, Lord God, this is it. Because, my God, we're going to exchange fear for faith. And we do so tonight, Lord God, by beginning to swim. Take what is before us. And pushing it behind us. Everything that they had to say, my God, that would have crippled, hinder, and shocked. Tonight, oh God, not only are we swimming, my God, but we're going to put on the life jacket. Fear is the anchor that we seem to hold on to. That plunges us to the bottom of the ocean. But tonight, God, we're doing an exchange. And as opposed to reaching for the anchor, tonight we're reaching for the life jacket and we're putting it on. Because we have to do some things in order to change our circumstance and our situation. Tonight, Lord God, we make the switch. We make the switch tonight. We're putting on the life jacket and we're going to swim. Swim through the discouragement. Swim through the doubt. Swim through the naysayers. Swim through the insult. Swim through, my God, being overlooked and being despised. And we... Start, my God, with the first stroke. The scripture says, let no man, Paul encouraged Timothy, who was a young preacher, and he said, let no man despise thy you. And so tonight we come. And that is the first stroke that we take towards our freedom. Let no man destroy, despise thy you. And the next stroke is I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. God, as we swim and as we move, the scenery begins to change. My God, the words that they have to say is fading in the distance because you're changing the environment. My God, the atmosphere is changing now because the spirit of the Lord is here. Change the atmosphere of our heart. Change the temperature of our heart. Your word declare unto us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. Tonight we come before you, and we're asking you, Lord God, 
to help us, my God, to change our posture and to change our position. And we do that by swimming, God, by swimming, by moving, by swimming, by moving, by swimming, by moving. David had to swim out of discouragement, and we too, God, have to swim out of discouragement. And so we come before you tonight, Lord God. And God, we're going to take a step of faith tonight. And the step of faith, oh God, that we're going to take tonight, it comes with, my God, first receiving the divine revelation that you have imparted unto us. And then we're going to believe. First we believe, rather. And then, my God, we're going to receive. And because we believe and we receive, this is what will allow us to move forward. We come before you tonight, Lord God, and we're asking you, my God, let these words be embedded in our mind. The essence of faith consists in believing and receiving what God has revealed. I am who God say I am. I am what God say I will be and not mine. The essence of faith consists in believing and receiving what God has revealed. I am who you say I am, and I am what you have declared me to be. And so, God, let this mind be in me to receive and to accept divine revelation about who I am. And why is that? Because everything you create, God, you do two things with your creation. Number one, you gives it a name. And number two, there's an assigned purpose to it. So I am what you say I am. And let me begin to swim out of everything that they had to say, quote unquote, they. And tonight, God, as we swim, my God, out of discouragement and out of doubt and out of fear. Again, we're taking what's before us and we're putting it behind us. Taking what's before us, pushing it behind us, and let us continue to swim because there is a place, my God, coming where we will get to the shores and we will rest. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, send me here to tell us that we need to swim. We need to swim. We need to swim. God, give me an acronym, my God, by tomorrow for the word swim so we can understand more of this divine revelation. Father, we look to you tonight, O oh God, and we say thank you in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen and amen. Amen. Mm. Mm.